today we're going to do a talk about uh, the idea of the commons. First off, um, we're going to show a short film which goes through, because you can't understand the commons without understanding the idea of the enclosure. So there's a short film which goes through how the commons and common land was taken away from people uh, through a series of enclosures over the past sort of five, six hundred years in particular. And then we're going to look at the more modern day enclosures and how enclosures have occurred um, since uh, it's Thatcher and the neoliberal agenda at the end of the 70s. And then at the end, I'm going to invite Ian to come up, who's going to talk a bit about the Hands Off Our Forest campaign, which was um, a, comp uh, a campaign last year which was set up to stop um, Britain's forests being sold off into private hands. So, I first, I'd like to start off by just telling a small story um, which sort of illustrates some of the themes of, about the commons. Uh, so there's, there's, this man sat, sat in a field under a tree and um, the farmer comes up to him and says to him, hey, what are you doing? So you're, you're, you're on my land, sat under my tree. And the guy goes to him, well, what, what makes it your land? And uh, the farmer says to him, well, my dad left it me. And he said to him, well, what made it your dad's land? He said, well, his granddad left it him. He said, well, what made it his land? He said, his great granddad left it him. He said, well, what made it his land? He said, well, he fought for it. So the guy stood up and said, well, I'll fight you for it then. <laughs> so, and that sort of is the commons <laughs> and in enclosures in, in a nutshell in some ways. <laughs> And uh, one other quote, which I, which I actually found the other day, which, which isn't by an historian, but by a, an American humorist called Don Marquieu, I think. He says, um, when a man tells you that he got rich through hard work, ask him who's. <laughs> so we're now going to watch, hopefully, a, a, a very quick introduction to the history of the commons. Oh, hello. I was just wondering if we had time for a quickie. Historical narrative, that is. Before the beginning, there was nothing. Actually, there was no nothing. No space, no time, not even a dark, empty void. Then, 14 billion years ago, there was a bang. A big one. <laughs> time and space and loads of energy were created. From this energy, particles and antiparticles were formed, but went around annihilating each other. Luckily, there were more particles than antiparticles, and these started to stick together to form atoms. Oh, hello. Gravity attracted the atoms to form stars, and later planets. Planet Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago, and on planet Earth, a primordial soup begat amino acids that begat proteins and DNA, cells, bacteria, invertebrates, vertebrates, reptiles, mammals, and... Ta-da! Homo sapiens. Now, the Homo sapiens wandered the earth, and it was good, but not that good because they decided to settle down and try a spot of farming. Thus, the fence was invented. Oh. In a small island called Britain, the Celts arrived in about 6 BC. Salto. They had a laugh for a while until the Romans turned up with a bit of the old Vinovidi Vici. However, Rome was sacked by the Vandals and the Romans went off in assault. I'm taking my ball home. Then came the Angles and the Saxons and the old Viking or two. A few Christians wandered across from Europe before the Pope got rid of the Celtic church because he wanted to be in charge of that sort of thing. Some would-be alpha males became kings and beat each other up occasionally. In these days, occupation was ownership, and if you could fight for it, you could keep it. We all know what happened in 1066. Oh, my eyes. William the Bastard, sorry, the Conqueror, day trip from Calais and claimed all the land in England to be his by right of conquest. In 1068, the Doomsday Book provided the first legal proof of who owned what. The king thought this was a very good thing for taxation purposes. The king took the land from those he thought were uncool and gave it to those people that he thought were cool. In return, he got taxes and the odd bit of military service. The Barontites let land to subordinates who in turn led to even subordinates. Somewhere down this ladder, some peasants actually did some farming. farming. The land was all owned by bigwigs, but this was communally accessed and managed by peasants so that under this feudal system, those above relied on those below to produce. If the barons Ow. upset him at the top, they got kicked out. If they upset those Ow. at the bottom, they got no rent or food. They did not like this state of affairs. Therefore, in 1215, when bad King John pissed off a few barons, they forced him to sign the Magna Carta. This began a long process whereby the barons took more control over the land. They liked this. 
In the 1530s, Henry VIII, not my gatty, oh, good shot, was upset sir. by the Pope, who said that divorce was a bad thing. They fell out. Henry burnt down a few monasteries and gave their considerable lands to his chums, who of course thought divorce was a good thing. They also thought sheep were good things. No, because you could sell wool for more money than you could get by letting land to the great unwashed. This they called increased productivity, really making the land work for them. The Crown and the Church were not sure about sheep at this point, but the barons were in love. In 1549, Robert Kett and a few thousand chums tried to go against the tide by rebelling against sheep and storming Norwich. They were chopped up by the Earl of Warwick and an army of mercenary Johnny foreigners. Later, in 1650, during the Civil War, the diggers tried to occupy and farm St George's Hill in Surrey, but Cromwell had them chopped up. Kings had tried to be nice to the peasants about common land because they thought it would make them popular and protect them from the Puritan types. However, the Puritans chopped up Charles I anyway. Oh. The Puritans were self-interested landowners who did not want to pay for the king's wars. They wanted to have their own. Like other landowners, they loved sheep and fences. Anyone into common land could not be in the Puritans' gang and tended to get chopped up. Cromwell died before anyone could chop him up, and soon the English landowners asked the neighbours for their king back. Enclosure continued apace through the Industrial Revolution. The landowner types thought this was great because they made lots of money from sheep and got no chip from peasant types anymore. The new city types thought this was great because displaced peasant types started working in their factories and making them money. The government and crown types also thought this was great because the country as a whole made a lot of money by cajoling people all over the world to buy factory-made stuff. This looked very efficient and productive, but the great unwashed did not think this was great. Oh, 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 they had to work for money to feed themselves rather than producing food directly. They were now wage slaves, don't, the new urban worker types. Don't, don't, Peasants don't, no longer existed. Don't, don't. Thus, the land had been enclosed and privatised. The feudal idea of communities producing enough for themselves, plus a few taxes, had given way to the idea of the national good, where selling things, profits and gross domestic products was what really mattered. In 1731, the Black Act made poaching a capital offence. Before this, the yes. Great Unwashed did not think of wild animals as belonging to anybody. Now those tasty deer, grouse and rabbits all belonged to the person whose land they were on. Thus, wild animals were easily privatised. It was now virtually impossible for the Great Unwashed to feed themselves without earning money first. In the mid-1980s, the patent office of the good old US of A decided you could patent anything except a whole-born human being. Only a few years earlier, they'd been adamant you couldn't patent anything living. Recently, seeds, plants, dolly the sheep, even parts of the human genome have been privatised through intellectual property. Thus, seeds have been privatised. First, you had to pay to farm the land. Then, you had to pay to hunt on the land. Then, you had to pay to grow certain crops. Now, they want us to pay for even the most simple recreational activities. Oh, my God. How did you fit that all in? Um... Couldn't you summarize for me? They hang the man and flog the woman who steal the goose off the common. But let the greater criminal loose who steals the common from the goose. How oh, succinct. Thank you and good night. Oh, good night. <laughs> If, if um, that film's actually on Bristol Radical History Group's website, if you want to uh, send it to people, you'll find it under their film section. Um, so, what I want to do now is just talk a little bit about what the first sort of enclosures meant um, to the way of life for, you know, the majority of the common people. And, because what, what effectively happened was, before... Mass, the mass enclosures of land in particular, people were pretty much self-sufficient. So, you know, people had the right of way, the right to hunt, the right to fish, that's where all these sort of terms come from. So they were able to actually meet their basic needs without, uh, mainly off the land, and at times having to do favours for the Lord or, or, or whatever. So it was a pretty, a pretty much self-sufficient way of living to a degree. So what happens... With the, why enclosures are so important is that it, it created a, a whole shift and, in, uh, to the Industrial Revolution and the development of capitalism and the development of people not being able to meet their needs through, uh, in, in a self-sufficient way. And also, it, it had quite a, a big impact on the idea of the, what the environment was used for. 
because the environment was initially seen as this thing for subsistence. So, so it was, you know, it was looked after. People, you know, didn't want to overfish. They didn't want to burn all the wood staying. They didn't want to use, all, you know, all the land. Everything, everything needed to be kept, kept there because they were reliant on it. So there was a shift from subsistence to exploitation and control of the land, which is, which is what happened with the huge enclosures acts. I mean, I think um, something like seven million acres of land was enclosed in a very short period of time, um, and. You know, there's lots, lots of people comment on, on, the, on the enclosures. For example, George Orwell wrote in 1944, he says, Stop to consider how the so-called owners of land got hold of it. They simply seized it by force, afterwards hiring lawyers to provide them with title deeds. In the case of the enclosure of the common lands, which was going on from about 1600 to 1850, the land grabbers did not even have the excuse of being foreign conquerors. They were quite frankly taking a heritage of their own countrymen upon no sort of pretext except they had the power to do so. Robert F. Kennedy talks, talks about the, this when he says, the first tyranny of, is, of governments is the complicity in privatising the commons for private gain. And currently, in our own property-owning democracy, nearly half the country is owned by 40,000 land millionaires, or 0.06% of the population. And if you think about that, how much money people have to spend just to buy a little plot of land to live on? Now, you know, if you, want to, you need to buy somewhere, buy your house. It will cost you, you know, in London, probably, you know, 300, 400 thousand pounds. No? Um, so, the enclosures led to this new dynamic in society where people had to work for other people in order to survive. And... That basically was the basis for the capitalist economy, really. So what, what I want to look at now is, you know, we've looked at land as an enclosure, but there's also um, huge amounts of other enclosures which have happened, particularly in this country, since uh, the rise of Thatcher and the neoliberal agenda. And all this sort of stuff, you can start to begin to see how it makes life much more difficult for common people, people like ourselves, to live and get by and have free time and, and just have a reasonable, easy life. So, under, the, under neoliberalism, which, which, which came about sort of with Thatcher in 1979 and Reagan in America, they, they had this idea that uh, the best way to run everything was through the market. And really this was the seeds of the problems that we're seeing now in, in, in terms of the economic crisis and that sort of thing, because they said that you know, everything should be deregulated, markets should be allowed to do exactly what they want, private interests should be able to run everything. Because they, they in their view, misguided, that is that, you know, that's the most efficient way of running things. So what we saw was a huge amount of privatization of stuff which we needed to meet our basic needs. So I'll just run through quickly how, how much stuff was actually privatised um, during 1979 to say, to, to up to now really, pretty much. So, in 79 to 82, British Aerospace and Cable and Wireless, which were phone, which were phone companies, state-owned phone companies, were privatised. 82 to 86, British Telecom, British Aerospace, Brit Oil, British Gas, I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember the SID campaign, Tau SID. That was all, again, more privatisation. Then 87 to 99, uh, 91, you had British Steel, British Petroleum, Rolls-Royce, British Airways, the water supplies, electricity supplies, all this stuff which was state-owned was transferred into the private sector. Then you had British Coal, PowerGen, National Power, British Rail, uh, taken into private hands. And then under New Labour, we also saw a continuation of the neoliberal agenda with more privatisation with hospitals being built using private money which we're now seeing the PFI initiatives and all this sort of stuff. Um, then, we, then we saw um, sort of new labour did privatisation by the back door really. So they, 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 did, they didn't really call it privatisation, they called it all, all different sorts of things but effectively it was the same sort of thing. So what happens, what that means is all our, all our basic needs all the stuff which we 
you, we need gas, electric, water, transport, all this stuff is now with prototypes. So now we see, like, you know, for example, British gas bills going up 40, 30, 40 percent every year, even though they're making billions of profits. And the same with all these different, like the water, electricity, all these sorts of things have been prototyped. So it's, what it's done is it's made it a lot more difficult for the average person to actually live because they're having to pay huge amounts of money to just asset, access the basic needs of stuff. So how, how can this happen? And the big, the big thing about it is that the mindset of people since 1979 has been, it's been so strong, the agenda of, the of states and governments in this country to put across this idea that everyone's an individual, everybody should meet their own needs, and that everything should be, you know, have a cost. You know, stuff shouldn't really be held in common for people, you know, and it shouldn't be about, the, everything should be based on profit and not the, you know, the basic common good. And they've actually been very effective <laughs> in doing that because most people struggle to think outside the box, outside, you know, that, that businesses shouldn't provide these things. But what's happening now is there is a development of a counter, a counter movement to this, um, particularly in the States and to a degree in this country, which is based around the idea of the commons, which is effectively taking back certain basic uh, fundamental services into common ownership. So they're owned and managed by people for, for, the, for the good of the community and the good of common, you know, the common people. So if I talk a bit, I'll tell you a little bit about this, this movement. Um, there's certain amount of principles around what, what, what a commons movement is and what it means to be a commoner. Most people are commoners and they don't even realise it. It's like if you fought to save, you know, your swimming pool being shut down or your library being shut down or any sort of service, you know, which is being used locally by the community, then really you're sort of coming under this commons movement. But their principles are that without exception, we all belong to our community and we all have an equal stake in what happens. We must recognise and repair the damage that has been done and the iniquities that have been created by our current market-based system. The things that belong to all of us must be named, claimed, defended, protected and improved. We have a mutual responsibility to take care of these commons and pass them on to the next generation in a better shape than we found them. We must honour our full humanity. We are not merely individuals and consumers. We are neighbours, community members, citizens and experts on the places we live. We are surrounded by abundance and opportunity that the market does not recognise or value. We must see and claim this abundance for the benefit of all. Everyone should have the chance to participate in defining, restoring, creating, managing, leading, governing and owning anything that is important to the future of the community. People most affected by critical decisions must be included in the process of making them. History, cultural distinctiveness and people's personal stories are important factors in setting goals and making decisions, as well as simply understanding our community. Sufficiency and resilience are the opposite of the folly of growth. Commons are the future, not the past, and the future is not a place to which we are headed. It is a place we create. We do not find past to the future, we make them. And the activity of making them transforms both, both those who engage in the process and our common destiny. So this movement about the commons is about reclaiming and taking back these um, common resources, common things which is needed for people basically to survive in their everyday, in their everyday life. So the Hands Off Our Forest campaign, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, was actually a resistance to the idea of the commons being taken away. Because the forests, it started in the Forest of Dean, which was um, it's a, a royal forest. So it's, it is actually sort of owned by the people in theory ish <laughs> but they were basically trying that the government wanted to sell off the whole whole swathes of forest to private investment mainly because there's um ta massive tax breaks you can get if you own forest you don't even have to maintain it but you can offset offset the land ownership so 
it's, I'm going to invite Ian up now to come in on stage. And we're going to have a bit of a, uh, a t explain to people a bit about how the hands off our forest works. Do you want to, do you want to sit back in? Yeah, right. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, both me and Mike are from Forest of Dean, so we, we, we were in both quite involved in the um, recent campaign to stop the sell-off sell of the forest estate, which, which makes up about 20% of, uh, of the woodland in, in, in this country. But it actually provides the, the most access because it's managed partly in the interests of everyone, and it also uh, supplies most of the timber uh, from which is produced in this country for for, uh, for, for the timber industry. Although we still have to have to in, we still have to import about uh, uh, eighty percent of our timber. M most of the private woodland, with one or two exceptions, is owned by private individuals or the banks or pension companies, and they they own it purely because it has massive tax advantages. Um, you don't have to pay inheritance tax on any woodland which is passed down from generation to generation. So the rich are buying up huge areas of our woodland, and particularly now where a lot of outside capital is coming into this country from places like Greece and Italy and Spain, where the rich are looking for safe places to put their money, the price of woodland and agricultural land is going through, going through the roof. They're not interested in producing food. They're not interested in producing wood. And they're not interested in allowing people to use a woodland for, for, for our recreational purposes. Um, so, so obviously when we found out, it was, it was um, uh, nearly about 18 months ago, that the government was planning to sell off the whole public forest estate they were going to they were introduce some legislation through the public bodies bill which would have given the secretary of state the right without recourse to parliament just to sell off everything obviously we were we we, we had to realize we had to we had to act quite quickly fortunately in the forest of dean there's a long tradition of anti-enclosure uh, movements there's a, there's a whole history which goes right right back to maybe to the 17th century where there were massive riots against attempts by the, by, by the king to hand over parcels of the forest land on leases so that, so that he, him and his, to, to, for their mates to come in and, and use the forest to produce uh, timber in the forest to produce charcoal for iron, ore produ for iron production. And there, that, that was resisted very, very strongly and these people were, were kicked out in the, in the 17th century. This, there, there was a long war of attrition. More, more famously, in 1830, there were massive riots in the Forest of Dean when the Crown sought, sought to enclose the forest for, for timber production for the Navy and to allow outside capitalists to come in and, um, and, and open, up, open up deep mines. Uh, the, the tradition is still alive now. People still have the right to, right to common in the forest. People keep sheep. And there's free mining rights, which means you have a, any, any person who's worked for a year and a, and a day in a pit in the forest of Dean has a right to start a mine up anywhere they like. And there's drift mines in the forest now. So particularly those commoners and those free miners in the forest, when they found out that they were going to sell off the forest, which would have meant an uh, open ticket for open cast mining and clear felling, we, uh, we organised very quickly. We organised meetings, and the local MP, who was a Tory, was was spearheading the campaign to sell off the forest. So they were, we were we were direct. We, we we found ourselves in direct conflict with our local MP, who obviously started. He 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 had to immediately. He was put under 24-hour police protection. Um, his house was surrounded constantly, um, and we we obviously started meeting. And we, we all, it, w the first really big event was, was uh, a year ago on uh, Jan January, um, two, two years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Where we organized, we built an effigy of parliament in Speech House in the center of the forest. It was big Ben, wasn't it? Big, oh, Big Ben, we yeah. We built Big Ben. Yeah. A massive yeah, Big yeah, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then there was a huge... Meeting. Yeah, yeah, we all went, there was bands, it was, a, it, was a, it was a beautiful day, it was snowing, we had bands playing outside, 3,000 people marched through the forest, 
And at that time, we still, we, we still felt quite alone. A lot of the other areas in the country who were under threat I hadn't really recognised how dangerous it was. But fortunately, because the images were, were so photogenic, they ended up on the front page of The Guardian of, 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 of Big Ben burning. And that, the campaign then, then went national. And, and within a few months, the, the government was forced to, to make a, a U-turn. And uh, they, the, the next stage was they, they set up a panel to look, to look into the future, future of not just the forest estate, which is run by the Forestry Commission, but out for, for, for the woodlands and the future of woodlands right across the country. And several weeks ago, ago they, they produced their recommendations. Their recommendations are that the forest estate should re retain in public ownership, but not just that, but outside the control of the government in trust for every single person in this country for, 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 uh, for their use, for, their, for access, for, and for woodland, uh, for, for wood production, and, and that this, this estate should be expanded, and that and private woodland owners should be forced to start making use of their land, of, of their woodlands in a proper way. Um, so it, it's, it was an incredible success. And I was, it's, but if the, obviously the, the government can still choose not, not, not to go ahead with the recommendations of the panel, but they're under a lot of pressure, and the pressure's still on for, to, force, to force them to accept these recommendations. So it's one of those few few instances where we've actually had a victory. So and I think anyone who was involved in those campaigns, thank you, and you know, long may the struggle continue. So, so what's, what's, what was interesting about the, um, the forest campaign was that it, it brought together lots of people who, from all different persuasions, who didn't actually want the Forest of Dean to be sold off. So rather than it just being like, you know, the local activists or the, you know, just, just a small group of people, it actually, it actually crossed a lot of political boundaries. Um, lots of people were really pissed off with the fact that they thought they could just come in and, and just take this land away. And I think it's really, really important to think about how, how, the, how these governments, the state, and particularly the state representing the ruling class in terms of privatising services and privatising land and new enclosures which are going on now is how they do it in such an insidious way. It's like the, the, this sell off of the forests was in this bill, was it the public, what was it the public bodies bill? Public bodies bill, which I don't know if you heard about how they, took, they um, were getting rid of all the quangos. So lots of quangos, like, like semi-government groups were getting rid of like trading standards and all these sorts of things. And they just put in this little bit about basically what we're going to do is we're going to sell off all the forests. And it was just this tiny bit in the act, wasn't it? Which, which, so they thought they'd just get it through. No one would know. And the next thing, all this land's just being sold off because it's gone through, it's gone through the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So, you know, another, another really important battle which is occurring now, which I think people need to should really... I, I can't understand why people aren't so angry about it, is the NHS. Because what's going on now is basically backdoor privatisation of the NHS. Now, what they want to do is they want to take our health service, which is free at point of contact, and privatise it. And all these people who are um, putting this legislation through at the moment, if you go on, there's a, a link on our website, on our Facebook page, which basically shows all the vested interests in healthcare companies that people in the House of Lords and the House of Commons have. And it's something like, it's a ridiculous amount of people being having these vested interests in private companies. Andrew Lansley, um, election, uh, his election campaign was funded, part funded by a private healthcare company. Now, if anyone thinks it's not, it, this isn't happening, then you need to think again, because it definitely is. And like, in, in America, if you get picked up by an ambulance, because right, you have an accident, they take you to hospital, you then get a bill to you for the cost of that ambulance. Plus, then you have to pay for your healthcare. There's a basic standard of healthcare, which is really minimal. But what, they're going to do, what they want to do in, the, in England is introduce marketisation into the NHS across the board. And they're doing it slowly, insidiously, 
and, and like private finance initiatives and all these sorts of things. And this is where I think really lies the core of this movement about the commons. It's basically what's going on now is the ruling class of this country are saying to everyone, we are going to take away all your needs, everything. We know if we take away the NHS, you will pay. If your kid's sick, you know, and you can afford a mobile phone, right, you're going to pay to have your kid's broken leg fixed. And they know that, and they know it's a gold mine, the NHS, because people can't do without it. And this shows the whole dynamic of where enclosure is being intensified. So, you know, people try, tend to think of themselves in, like, oh, I'm this sort of political group, or this sort of political, idea, you know, I might be a Tory, I might be Lib Dem, I might be Labour, blah, blah. I think people really need to sort of get down and actually look at what's going on. And what is going on is the common people of this country, which includes the majority of the population, the 99% or whatever, need to sort of wake up and see what's going on. Because this, these governments are, are, want to privatise everything because they know at the moment, the economic system is in decline because we're in this massive crisis of capitalism. So they're looking at what can we take, how much stuff can we take now before it, before it completely goes down the pan? Or even, and even if it doesn't, they're using it as, as an excuse. You know, when they talk about, oh, we, want, we need to privatise this, we need to introduce the market to stimulate the economy and all this, it's all rubbish. What they're doing is they're enclosing, and they're enclosing more and more stuff every day. You know, like they want to, in Bristol recently, they've tried to sell off the, the parks, wasn't it, Ian? It's another thing, like selling off lo local parks. You know, over, um, you know, over the last 30 years, we have seen more and more privatisation of all these, all these things. And you have no actual say over how that happens. I mean, the only reason, really, the Hands Off Our Forest campaign worked was because it was such a, a multifaceted campaign, wasn't it? There were so many people involved that they couldn't, they couldn't ignore it. But the NHS and all this sort of stuff, which is actually probably more important in terms of general well-being, is, is I would urge anyone to start, to start to think about this and get involved in it. Because it is, the NHS is one of the biggest, most important common resources there has ever been. I mean, if you think, you know, you could just go to your, you can go, you're ill, you go to the doctor and you get sorted out. You know, uh, imagine if that's not there, then it, it's, it's a real, uh, it, uh, it'd be an absolute nightmare. You know, imagine if you have to start paying. I mean, they're trying to introduce loads and loads of stuff at the moment to make people pay more and more and more money for everything. And this is why I think what inspires me about a common, the idea of the commons as a movement is that, you know, it doesn't have to be particularly ideological in, in the political outlook although obviously it is more towards the left, but it can bring in huge amounts of people under one banner, which says, actually, we just want this stuff, we want this stuff to be used for the, be the benefit of common good and not for the benefit of profit and a small elite of people who are going to make an absolute fortune out of these things. So if you want, if you want to find out more information about the commons and about these issues, check out our website, there's some flyers at the front here if anyone wants any. And we update, we've got lots of stuff going up on there about these sorts of issues. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. If anyone's got any questions or well, I, I lose my voice. <laughs> What's your thoughts on squatting? On, on squatting? Yes. Well, well, I mean, I, I have no problem with squatting. I think the bigger issue is really about how how the resources are distributed in this country in terms of... I mean, really, I, I would argue that it would be much better if we didn't have to have squatting because there was adequate housing for everyone which was affordable and, and accessible. And again, that, that goes right back to the, to the film that we were watching earlier. Why, 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 do we, why do people have to squat? Well, they have to squat because they haven't got access to land. Bottom line. They haven't got access to land. They haven't got access to, to property because, again... The state has allowed house, house prices to go through the roof because of had to stimulate the economy by giving those, pumping loads of money in through the housing market. So we're in a, in, a, in a terrible situation and they've stopped all house building. So that stops basically the, that allows there to be much more competition in the market. So 
because there's not a, an abundance of housing, housing becomes really, really expensive. So I would say, yeah, squatting's fine, but the bigger issue is actually, how do you take back land? How do you take, and how do you develop a system where everyone has adequate housing? Just come back to yeah. the last two uh, uh, buildings that I've squatted have been owned by companies that are registered in the tax haven of Liberia. The yeah. current place where I'm, where I'm staying has been left empty for 20 years by a, a landowner who owns, owns multiple properties and he's been waiting for the right price so the, mm. the community and the council have been unable to, to wrestle this place yeah. off it. So we've gone in and we've turned it into a community garden. Mm. And they're trying to, they're trying to criminalise squatting now in residential buildings and this is all part of the same process yeah. of, of, of criminalisation and concentration of land ownership. Well, I mean, squats, yeah, the squatting, I mean, I think, I don't know if the actual legislation has gone through now about squatting. I think it might have gone through, the legislation. Oh, yeah. It has. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it all comes down to basically distribution of resources again. All these, and, and, and power. And who has the power to distribute the resources? Who has the power to decide what happens to what? So all these issues, I would argue, everything, food production, energy, housing, water, all this stuff, you know, they, they will privatise, they tried to private, they, they, they tried to privatise water in, um, was it, oh, I think it was Argentina? Was it Ar Boli Bolivia, yeah, and they, they basically went in and said, we're going to take control of your, your water supply, which completely outpriced, like most, the majority of people then couldn't afford to buy water. Yeah, so they basically got kicked out. Bolivia went, no way. You know, people in Bolivia just went, you know, you're not doing that. Right. So it does. There are, there is a lot of resistance going on to, to um, it, what, what, what you can look at as future enclosures. And the other, I mean, the other interesting thing about enclosures is it's not just about, um, you know, land or resources. They, they they enclose ideas. You know, like I, you know, they're saying that. You know, we're, we're going to look at the, uh, the genetic makeup of a, of a tree and go, that's ours. We're patent that. It's like, really? <laughs> How can you patent a tree? So, like, they will do everything they can to make money. And, and that's, that's what, to me, that's what's the really important battle now is, you know, to me, like parliamentary politics are, are redundant. You know, they all do the same. They all, they all got the same agenda. They all believe in the market's best, market rules and privatisation. So what, what's needed now really is a common people's movement, which is going, actually, no, you know, we resist that. And it's interesting that you don't hear about a lot of the resistance to the original enclosures. You know, when, when you're at school and you're taught history, you're not taught about the peasants' revolt which happened in 1381 when thousands of people went in and said, no, you're not, when they tried to implement a poll tax and a tax on, a tax on land, I think. And, and then there, there was Ketz Rebellion. There's all these resistances to enclosures and these ideas of enclosure throughout history, which are completely ignored. So when people go on, oh, you know, England, fair and pleasant land and all this sort of thing. No, actually, England and land developed through a mass of struggle and his, you know, there's a, a huge amount of historical struggle, which Samuel and Roger can tell you about later, a little bit. <laughs> um, and Bristol Radical History Group's website is really good for if you want to know lots more about this stuff. They've got loads of talks that they filmed up on there. But uh, I just come to a close now. So I would just say, like, think about when, you, when you're looking at what's going on and what the state is currently doing under the Tories. I, I think it's always useful to think about who's going to make a profit from this, what are they enclosing, what's their real agenda. They will say things like, oh, the NHS, well, we need to introduce, you know, these markets because we need to make it more efficient. Or we need, you know, we need to, um, you know, we can't continue this way because it's not e economical. And, and you'll, you'll, you will see how they drip feed this information out. So it's like with... Um, cutting back, say, for example, disability benefits and cutting back benefits for people, they drip feed stuff all the time. They go, oh, benefit strangers, the whole 26,000 pain, people on benefits get 26,000 pain. Well, what, like 0.01% of people on benefits gets 26,000 pain, and mainly because they live in London and they got huge housing costs. 
which is to do with rent. So they drip feed this stuff and then they bang in this legislation. So they go like, oh, look at all these people, benefit strangers, benefit strangers, benefit strangers. It's almost like, you know, consistently being told. And then suddenly they go, yeah, we're gonna cut benefits. And they've already set up these ideas in people's consciousness so they can then push forward massive cuts. So on that happy note, <laughs> resist, resist. And get involved locally with um, campaigns to protect you know, anything which is held in public ownership, I would say. But particularly, I think you will see a campaign build around the NHS soon because people will stop being able to access healthcare. I mean, it's already happening. P GPs are turning people down and saying, we haven't got the, the budget to fund your, your, your health issue. And they're being sent to other areas. So keep, keep an eye on that and try and get involved in, in that sort of thing. And keep, keep stuff common. That, that would be the, the last thing. Everything should be common. Everything. <laughs> Thank you.